This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. following conversations with artists David Benjamin Sherry and Fred Tomaselli took place at that time of the day. David Benjamin Sherry is an artist based in Los Angeles. His large-scale, color-saturated photographs of places such as Yosemite and Grand Staircase Escalante evoke a tradition of Western American landscape photography, while at the same time conjure a mystical, plaintive vision of a threatened natural environment. Certain Western landscape photographers like Ansel Adams and Minor White and Carlton Watkins and maybe Joel Sternfeld, you embrace that legacy. I think you very consciously think of how you continue that. And not all artists want to reference their forebears in such a direct way. But can you talk about you know how you think of those those previous masters of yeah. photography? Well, initially I thought of them as um, like I just was so drawn to the work. I was like just. Um, enamored by the technical skill and the place. I grew up on the East Coast, so um, I never really went out west. Like, it wasn't part of my um, upbringing, and it was just something that I kind of fell in love with through pictures. And as I started moving up in camera size from a like, medium format to a large format to a eight by 10, it felt like it was just part of the territory that you kind of have to understand about yeah. what's been done with this camera and how it's, how it's been used to document the West. It was a te technology in the 19th century you had to use. Right. It was something you carried around up the mountain. And to use it now, it feels to me like the scale of the camera almost is what you need for the scale of the landscape around you. It's that and also actually like I have like long fingers. I'm a tall person. Like <laughs> I was kind of always fumbling with uh, smaller cameras mm -hmm. and I felt like it didn't feel like it was like this extension of my vision, let's mm -hmm. say. So actually using an 8x10 camera, at times it can feel really bulky or clumsy. But when I'm photographing a landscape, it feels right. Like it just mm -hmm. feels perfect. And I understand the history of why that camera was being used for what it was being used for. So. I realized after trying to conquer my own idea of the West, like in some earlier landscape pictures and kind of recreate mm -hmm. their pictures, that A, the landscape has drastically changed. It's drastically right. changing as we speak, mm -hmm. more so than it was when they were photographing it. Mm -hmm. But B, also that me having this kind of outside perspective, this queer perspective of the mm -hmm. world and how I fit into it or don't fit into it, right. um, I'm actually queering this space. And yeah, and no, let's talk about it for sense. a second as in photographic terms, straight photography always means yeah. like documentation. Right. In other words, unmanipulated, in focus, you know, you don't you don't do the things that we can easily do now with digital technologies, but you do something very dramatic in most of your pictures, right. you colorize them or you right. and you do it in a very analog way. Do you right. want to talk about that technique? Yeah, so as I started kind of venturing out to take these pictures and learn about the process of it, I found that not only was I documenting something that was remarkably different, physically different than what was being photographed before, but it's a different time and this is a different era of yeah. how we think about the world and how we think about landscape photographs. And, and this was an era of like the beginning of the national parks yeah. at the time that right. Weston, for right. example, or even Minor White was out photographing Yosemite, so. There, um, nobody had really seen, I mean, Ansel had to kind of provided the world view or right. American view of these places. Right. And I think Weston worked alongside him, but Weston, didn't he consider him more of like this artist that was like photographing bodies and like, <laughs> you know. Right. It was like landscape and bodies. Female nudes. Female nudes, yeah. specifically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Something kind of clicked for me. As I started making the work, I'm like, well, there's nothing that 
new and exciting about Yosemite, besides it being the most unbelievable, magnificent, magnificent place. And hard to actually capture in a photograph. So hard to right? capture in a photograph. But I felt like I, I developed this color process when I was in grad school and Richard Benson was there and we took this amazing class that he always taught every year, the photographic print. Everything that I was interested in at the time, like magic, mysticism, queerness, the print can kind of come to life in a way that the if, picture... If the negative is the, the score, the print is the performance. Exactly, right? yeah. And I think maybe Ansel Adams would say the same. Why is a particular landscape yellow. Why do you yeah. choose to make another one magenta? So that's, it's a good question and something I think about constantly. Why am I drawn to this and, and these colors and using color in this way? And I've realized that if we tie it back to like historical beginnings of Manifest Destiny, the American West, how it was documented, how we think of landscape dominated by the male mind. The exploitative mind. Yeah. Resources. Think, you know, exactly. Mining. Yeah, mining resources. Yeah. You know, being witness to that as somebody that has, you know, my queer family, my people, my real family, my chosen family, we're all <laughs> queer. Um, you know, when I think about that and I think about the queer body and, and the American landscape, there there is this connection. You know, I think about ecofeminism and the idea of like landscape and the female body has been dominated by this patriarchal power system. You know, as a queer person, I also feel that this kind of patriarchal society has kind of dominated queer bodies and the landscape. So in a way, it was a performance to kind of go out to these places. And it, it's a performance to kind of be in these spaces that are not necessarily safe for queer people. Yeah. Um, or historically haven't been. As, you know, the last five years, things have drastically changed. Yeah. So I feel like I'm seeing more queer people in national parks and state parks and in the desert. Like, you know, and I, it's really nice to see that. Why and is you, that? I don't know. I just think that our, I think culture is changing. It's like everything is kind of happening. Bizarrely enough, it feels to me that even with this sort of like oppressive fascist direction that the U.S. government is going in, it feels to me that there's this sort of like massive pushback culturally. And it feels a little bit like all the cultural institutions and even individuals in this society are expressing themselves more yeah. honestly than ever. And I think sometimes it feels lame like maybe it isn't doing any like real political work right but on the other hand i also feel like it's a kind of tide or something yeah, like that, that it resists. does feel like a yeah. tide i mean since trump's been office it's like at this point at this very point i feel like i mean actually lana del rey says it in her new <laughs> song that just dropped this weekend and i can't get enough of the album and her but she says culture is lit and if mm -hmm. this is it, I've had a ball. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like the most beautiful kind of, it's kind of her apocalypse song, but it's right. it's not like this. It is sad, It's, it's it, you, the way she's kind of describing what's happening, but at the same time, it's like, at least the culture is on fire. Like it feels like art, mm -hmm. culture, music, writing, theater, everything is really saturated right now in right. a really good way, which is exciting. And that's what happens when you have an oppressive, terrible person in the office maybe right no no like desert plants you know when they're about to die are forced to bloom it's right. a kind of strange paradox of life that you know when right. something's about to to die it actually sends off tons of yeah maybe emergency color or mating whatever happens completely yeah, yeah it's totally tied it's totally parallel to that that's the only kind of beautiful thing that's come out of this yeah in, in, a, in a way in my mind is just like that there's really interesting stuff happening in the world all of a sudden. It's that, a perversion of nature as we know it. I mean, I, I've, I have days of feeling incredible sadness about like the deaths of species. Me and too. That's been the hardest. Really. Things like that. Just but how I'm, lonely this world will be without, if it's yeah. just humans left, you know? But I also, yeah. but I also think to myself that there's going to be a massive reset. I mean, we think the world is ending. Right. We say it that right. way, but it's ending for us, right. really. And it may not end for other life forms. It may end. It may not end for other species. Do you think that there's any hope for a kind of like you know halting the the destruction, the rainforests now in Brazil and all that, or do you think there's just going to be a, a reset? Yeah. It's such a hard question. It's so sad. I try to be an optimist with my work in a strange way. Like mm -hmm. I think that. 
the color, like going back to this earlier question about like using color in this monochrome color and the saturated intense color. Color is uh, inspiring, you know, it's like stained glass windows or yeah. something. It's almost like religious belief, I think. It is, and I think that that's what I'm interested in somehow conveying with my work is like there's a deep sadness, there's a political angst that's behind all of this new work that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this color kind of can feel like there's hope, there's something mm -hmm. deep inside that rock, deep mm -hmm. inside that mountain that's like emanating all this energy, mm -hmm. this colorful, healing, beautiful energy. That That's what I feel. Mm -hmm. Like I just feel like I'm tuned into it and a lot of, maybe other people are not. So that's where the answers are. That, that's where I think, yeah, I think the, the planet may live on. It's and, consoling to think that, you know, that the things will outlive us. Yeah, all these species that are going extinct. What makes me really sad is thinking about like elephants and yeah. um, all these species that are going extinct. And I just heard something on the radio and, and it was like the scientists talking about humans on this earth with these species, mm -hmm. like living together. We've had like the most, we've had paradise. We've been given right. paradise. Like this is heaven, like mm -hmm. we're here mm -hmm. and the fact that they're, we're, we're killing them through this sixth extinction. Because we're all trained to, to, to consume. Like right. we, we have, you know, the ability to buy plane tickets and go places and swim with and, dolphins. And but, see the world and, yeah. and, and do all those things, but it's gone haywire, you know. It also makes me appreciate it in ways and appreciate being alive today, now, and that I'm, you know, privileged to go make this work and be able to go see these places and, mm -hmm and bring them back into New York and, and show people what's happening at least out west and yeah. how the world looks today. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I feel like my work was like born out of a nostalgia, you know, and, and that's like, I it's used It's a bad to, word in, in art it generally. Is. Yeah. It totally is. And, and I remember in grad school that was just like, are you nostalgic? Like, you know, like, and now it's like, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm like... Well, and this nostalgia, I think, is technically defined as a 19th century condition where you can't cope with the present reality right, and you right. snap, you break, yeah. and you yeah, go back, totally. revert to childhood or something like that. You know, I'm on the cusp, I was born in 81, so I'm like, I'm a millennial and also Gen X, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm literally, it's 81, as they say. You're a translator. I'm a translator, so I go between both different days making the work is like as you can imagine is you know deep solitude mostly alone out in wilderness it's it's something that i was you know really it never is easy to like if i go out for three weeks to go shoot or a month or something you know that's that's a good amount of time it takes me a solid day or two days to really start like shedding myself of like just modern day you know, all the things, the trappings that we have that we're all so accustomed You're to. You're craving for a vegan, you know, burrito <laughs> yeah, or something. Right, right. My green smoothie is like, <laughs> I need it. I mean, I make it, I will buy one. But as soon as you go into like Utah desert, there's no green smoothie. Right. But, you know, it's, I, and then all of a sudden I come home and I'm like covered in dirt and just like, I feel so much better. Like, I just feel so reset. Cleansed. Yeah, and I've seen something that like a lot of people don't get to see and experience, yeah. so it feels really good. A show of David Benjamin Sherry's photographs titled American Monuments is on view at Salon 94 in New York City until October 26th. A book with the same title will be published by Radius Books this fall. Fred Tomaselli is an artist living in New York. His lush, collage-like paintings invoke a delirious realm of natural and cosmic constellations. His recent paintings, executed as adroit doodles over the front pages of the New York Times, offer playful and stinging commentary on news and current events. You're a collagist, in a sense, but you, you collect things. You collect actual ephemera from leaves and pictures to pills and things that get embedded in these things that are like right. reliquaries. Like any artist, it, it, it starts around questions around perception. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I mean, I think that's the fundamental um, 
issue within art. And these works, you know, the, the, the commingling of the real, the photographic, and the painterly mm -hmm. kind of create a little bit of visual dis, uh, confusion, I think, in the viewer's eye and in their mind as to what's real and what's not real, mm -hmm. you know, what's a depiction. The materiality of it is sort of rooted in that. But also, having grown up Catholic, you know, <laughs> um, I, I do sort of feel that in a funny way, like the, the backstories that happen within Catholic tradition, you know, it's not just a bone, but it's a bone of the saint, or this right. isn't just a piece of wood, it's the piece of the true cross. These objects sort of like rely on language to create a narrative that, get, that supercharges them with extra meaning. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, I sort of feel like that's sort of not unlike language-based conceptual art. And I don't think it's a, it's, it's a mistake that, say, Duchamp took a urinal and declared it as art. It's almost like a transubstantiation yeah. uh, you know, ritual where you take a piece of bread and it becomes the body of Christ, right? right? right. So I like to have that supercharged information backstory literally embedded inside the works. Mm -hmm. And then they, those works can then maybe become, you know, sort of Proustian, you know, objects that can take people yeah. to, you know, whatever their personal conclusions might be. They have a kind of cosmic subject matter or aesthetic, and they also feel to me very um, kind of quiet and self contained. It reminds me of Vermeer, you know, painting these very quiet interior portraits during this kind of bloody war with Spain and the Dutch were revolting against. It was a troubled time sure. and it feels to me similar that your works almost have a kind of a escapism into something that's tranquil and personal versus sort of the turbulence of the world around us. And I'm not just saying now in 2019, I think, you know, since the 1960s, it's been a pretty unstable. When I started my thing uh, in the mid 80s, Reagan was president, and it seemed like the, he was the ascendancy of the un unreal. Mm -hmm. He was this actor portraying a president, and everybody was buying it. And I didn't think anything could get more meta than that. Mm -hmm. Little did I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like jokes on me, right. you know? But this idea of escapism, it happened with, you know, Morning in America, and it also happened with LSD and disco, you know, kind of like escapist cultures, but also like mall culture. And then we also, uh, our dominant commodity as Americans mm -hmm. is escapism, our movie yeah. industry, our theme parks. So to me, it had a political edge to it, mm -hmm. and I, I, I wanted to get to that obliquely. How do you understand? Understand it without going on that ride in a way. I mean, my original works uh, way back when started out as uh, utilizing tropes that came out of theme parks. I grew up really close to Disneyland, <laughs> so I didn't really understand how weird it was until I left uh, Orange County, California, mm -hmm. where I grew up. But I wanted the viewer to kind of be in a trippy, theme parky, sort of escapist, fun world, but also maybe think about what that was and what they were going through. So that was part of the subject of the work. You moved in the 80s to New York, right? And, yeah, 1985. And it feels more real in New York somehow. Is that your explanation? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I mean, hard to say. I mean, New York has become its own sort of theme park. Let's talk about the New York Times, that series you've okay. done. It's interesting that your book, The Times, came out in 2016, I believe. You're already doing this series during the Obama administration. You started it during the Bush administration. 2005. Perhaps, 2005. Yeah. 2005. Mm -hmm. Basically decorating the front page of the New York Times with some interpretation of the lead article. The first one apparently was one of the Bernies, correct? Yeah, Bernie Ebers, yes. uh, WorldCom, financial disaster. And I just was so compelled by it on so many levels. I identified him as a, t a terrible person mm. uh, responsible for the uh, you know, destruction of a company. 10,000 people like ended up losing their jobs mm -hmm. over this guy's greed. But I also was like uh, compelled by the fact that he was grasping the hand of his wife. And the stunned look on his and his wife's face weirdly humanized him, and I, I couldn't get to the bottom of like how dislocating that photograph was. Like, yeah. I hate this guy, but he's a human, he's got a wife. I just had a mostly negative feelings, but I had other feelings and was unsettled. Mm -hmm. Without knowing quite what I wanted to do with it, I just started drawing on it as a way of maybe trying to get inside of what was happening. Right. And uh, I mean, little did I know it would be kind of like one of the early shots of the coming financial crisis, right? Yeah. Which would happen a couple of years later. As I progressed inside this, this uh, body of work, 
you know, it occurred to me that all collages are kind of working with this sort of collective imagery of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the newspaper is already that, a commingling of editors and writers and photographers mm -hmm. and fact checkers, and they've all come together as this, 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 this hive mind, and mm -hmm. they've decided to spotlight what they want you to see mm -hmm. and turn away from the things they don't want you to see. Mm -hmm. That relationship between truth and fiction, perception and collectivity all seemed to be germane to my ideas about what I was already up to. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like a natural place to go. Well, there's a long history of, like I said earlier, of uh, artists bringing the newspaper into the artwork. During the 20s, for example, the Weimar Republic, you know, you have the great collages, Hartfield and Hannah Hirsch and yeah. these different people. And it was a time similar to this, perhaps, with rising tides of fascism and almost a kind of hysterical cry, you know, warning cry to, to sort of uh, declaim, you know, dictators as they were emerging and that sort of thing. I see a lot of political art and I ask myself sometimes, is it effective in any way? Um, or is it just something cathartic for, you know, for the consumers of it? Maybe cathartic, maybe not that effective. I mean, I don't, I'm not ex uh, kidding myself. I don't expect, right. you know, to, to um, elicit any like meaningful social change to what I'm up to. And I think my work is ambiguous enough so that, you know, you don't really, I mean, I, th I think you can tell I'm on the left side of things, sure. but, but I, don't, I don't know if I'm like, you know, underscoring a particular agenda. Maybe visual art and art galleries and museums may not be the great, con maybe yeah. not the best context to, to create political art that, mm -hmm. that has resonance to the culture, I think. You have to get more pop with that, and that's mm -hmm. just not my thing. I mean, there's some really great political art out there, sure, yeah. but I don't know how how much it can resonate inside culture. I think it, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, just like what the medium that you're working in is, like what kind of power that what that it can do, it, yeah. what it can do. I think in some ways maybe it's about building a kind of PR machine and educating the population about Trump's crimes uh, right. before before there's real action taken. When there were three networks, you could do that. Yeah. Now everybody has their own micro bubbles of, of you know, yeah. their confirmation biases are all being answered inside whatever media bubble sphere they, they tend to be in. Yeah. So uh, again, getting back to the notions of perception and reality, mm -hmm. you know, that my, my fundamental issue as an artist, we have multiplicity of truths that are multiverses mm -hmm. that are existing in this country. But that's the fundamental, you know, kind of issue right now in general is this idea of our realities and our perceptions and the notions yeah. of truth and fake news and non-truth. It's like, you know, I mean, art is kind of not such a bad place to sort of like look at these issues. You know, when I started this New York Times project, mm -hmm. I'm sort of like, you know, I kind of hate you sometimes, but I can't really do any better. I guess we're stuck, you know, <laughs> when me and you were stuck together, mm -hmm. you know, because I can't really find anything that feels that has more truth yeah. generally, right? Yeah. But I was also really pissed off at it, you know, from time to mm -hmm. time. They did a terrible job in the run-up to the Iraq war. So I'm, I'm having this sort of like argument with it, but also I had some real affection for it because I, I, I subscribed to it, I read it. As far as I could tell, it, it, you know, they were trying to get it right. So there was a little bit of a kind of maybe your critique. Drawings, your drawing, drawings seem to be an active struggle with the Times. In a, yeah, in I'm, some I'm way. struggling Rome with wrestling. it. Well, it started out with me struggling with what do I think about this? and. Now, with the constant attack on it, I mm -hmm. feel very much affectionate and protective of it, and protective of like papers like it and the Washington, especially the Washington Post, yeah. which I'm really digging more. It's one of the few institutions that's keeping democracy from completely collapsing. Yes. I'm really feeling uh, quite uh, affectionate and tender towards <laughs> mainstream media. So my, my feelings have changed a bit yeah. since I began this project. In some ways, I think this whole mess has made made us appreciate more certain things like democracy, things oh we might take it for granted. The democracy, world is so upside down. The president, presidency itself. Is so upside down. You know, I'm an old beat up punk rock malcontent. If you would have ever told me that I would be on the side of the FBI <laughs> for any reason at all, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I would just say, what? Well, <laughs> I have a newfound respect now for the institutions. Right. It's very interesting, that's how upside down it is, that mm -hmm. I am now like fully on board with the institutions yeah. of this country and hope that they can withstand the onslaught that we're up against right now and hope that we can get our, get our country, you know, back into, 
some nice mainstream, some mediocre, neoliberal-like. <laughs> There's a particular uh, New York Times collage, which is uh, sort of Chinese tech laborers over bodies of, you know, the fallout from some Middle Eastern war. Can you talk right. about that one? Because that to me seems seems very much about this this sense of um, what's really happening in the world, this sort of uh, global corporate takeover of governments around the world and the war of, you know, tech and wars. Cheap, you know, globalized third world labor and piles of broken bodies seems to be emblematic of the kind of stateless corporate world that we now live in. Mm. Part of the problem with, with, with globalism, as I see it, is that labor is treated like slaves right. and the environment is treated like a garbage can. Mm -hmm. You know, like they, these guys can just sh go whatever cheap country where there's no uh, mm -hmm. environmental laws and we can wage wars on behalf of these corporations. There's something else to this. It's almost, almost sort of like a ritualistic purification ritual, just as the perp walk on the, on the front page of the New York Times is some kind of like purification ritual or something. I feel in some ways the shootings have become like that too, and not just as content for newspapers, but as an actual um, you know, repeated process that people go through emotionally every time it happens. It's almost like we're sacrificing virgins, you know, like yeah. Aztecs, you know, at the top of our pyramid, you know, we have right. to, in order to keep everything going, we have to like, you know, have a weekly mm -hmm. sacrifice. My world is being pierced by the kind of chaos and the extreme depravity of the world mm -hmm. is constantly entering, you know, through my phone, mm -hmm. through the radio, through text image. Mm -hmm. I wanted to acknowledge that kind of friction between the world like as it is in a certain kind of idealistic way mm -hmm. and the world as it is in a kind of electronic sort of nagging awful way. And I wanted to, uh, to kind of like make work utilizing that kind of friction because that seems to be my reality. I'm lucky, you know, that, that I can be somehow removed from this suffering and only read about it. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to maybe acknowledge that particular kind of reality. Fred Tomaselli is part of a group exhibition titled Nomadic Murals, Tapestries of the Modern Era at the Vetchler Museum of Modern Art in Charlotte, North Carolina until December 1st. A solo show of his work opens at Marlborough Gallery in New York City on October 10th. <laughs>